it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome to my show today. Uh, I have Crispian Mills from the band Cooler Shaker. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much. I was just saying, uh, I wish I had a bit more of a rock and roll um, look to this. I'm in an Airbnb. Um, usually I have, you know, skulls and all kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> so there are plenty of skulls around. You've got, you've got, you've got decks. You've got decks there. you got skulls. I mean, you got it's all going on. Yeah, it's just kind of, it's what is, it's who I am on that front. Um, <laughs> got the metal side. We've got the dance side. I've got the DJing side. I've got right. everything going on in this one. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's not bad. I mean, it looks like quite a nice Airbnb for uh, what I can see right there. So, it's very beige. But it's, um, you know, I, I worked. Um, uh, I worked uh, when we recorded a track called "Sound of Drums." We we worked with George Draculius and and Rick Rubin. And um, we had a, a lunch at, at Rick's house, and he had he had a he had a, a full sized stuffed polar bear, wow. in, uh, just going into the into the <laughs> into the living room. So um, you know, yeah, he had that kind of like metal metal hip hop gothic weird thing going on. Yeah, did I mean yeah. he some yeah. iconic bands. Uh, of the metal genre, like from thrash metal, from like Slayer, and uh, obviously the hip hop side of things as well. Um, and, both, and both his parents designed um, trainers for babies. That's crazy. Nobody knows that, but oh, I, I now, didn't do that until now. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, like I said before the interview, I'm a huge fan. I mean, back when I was um, younger. Uh, we're talking obviously mid nineties and stuff. If we want to go back that far, which is scary to think how far away that was, but, um, no, I very much was, I was, I had a, my friends very much metal crowd. Um, so I was into that, but I always loved my indie as well. Um, I grew up in a household of, of the Beatles, the doors, um, Clapton, all that lot, uh, throughout the years, the shadows and whatnot. And, um, I always had that kind of like indie vibe to a lot of the sort of, like music I liked along with the heavier stuff but you guys really took me by surprise of like the sort of elements that you that you brought together obviously you had the kind of rock vibe blues vibe if you will but you also incorporated the um or just like other cultures of the Indian culture for instance which is the big one obviously um, <laughs> um but into that sound and it was a totally different experience I mean I saw I think I saw you guys I know I saw you guys live um I want to say it was at the Astoria in London. That was my main sort of like haunt back then. Um, but like just the tracks off K were just monumental, I think, on that front, you know, to sort of not to sort of hark on your previous um, successes on that front. <laughs> but it was a very big part of my like, you know, mid teens. I was 16, right. 16 at the time. So yeah. the music was that, that when that music hits you at that age it stays with you um and you know tracks like hey dude hush govinda uh tadva um even the track you did with the prodigy as well uh was it Nar narayan Nar narayan Nar yeah, yeah yeah stuff like that. and i followed you guys back then and obviously then you guys decided to take a, a break or split um at that point and um you know and and kind of i mean you've done stuff up until now but here we are um, and I got my hands on your new album <laughs> um, um, through the wonderful people uh, behind the scenes. And um, yeah, totally fell back in love with it. Um, like I, I had you guys on, I'd randomly play you guys at the club, like with DJ app, you know, I play out Harsh or Hey Dude, because there were sort of like bigger, heavier tracks, if you will. Um, but yeah, no, then you guys hit this this album you've got um, out now. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get the title right first congressional church of eternal love and free hugs uh, <laughs> which is a fantastic title for an album um and you know, there's, not enough, um, there's not enough uh double concept albums out there and um and to have a you know to have a you know they, a double concept album really should have a lofty title that no one can remember and um and that and, and even our publishers can't can't get it right. They can't remember it. They, they it's actually the first congregational church 
Oh, and they've and on one of their press releases they printed the congressional. So even they were <laughs> getting it wrong. With all well, that's it. That is the selling point of this record. Is no one can remember the title. You know. No, it's. I mean, I, I love the album. I love the track "Gingerbread Man." Um, that was one of my favourites off there, and the one you've just uh, released as a single as well. The um, whatever it is, I'm against it. Um, which is a great track. It's the first. Well, yeah, it's the first track off the album as well, isn't it? So, um, it's a great introduction. Obviously, after the intro, which is uh, um, quite fun. On the, <laughs> I had it on at work today, and people were wondering what I was listening to until the music kicked in. So <laughs> it's like a church service. Um, but that was great. I mean, that entwines in the album as well. Um, so what, what was the, like, obviously doing the sort of like dual uh, or double um, uh, theme to the album, but was that the general aim when you started or was it something that just kind of came together um, towards the end? Yeah, yeah, we did think it was going to be um, a normal album. You know, if there is such a thing as a normal album, and uh, we, we, you know, we had we had a lot, a lot of material, and um, and we were recording, and we were saying, oh, we're going to whittle it down to the absolute, you know, best. But it was a, it was a kind of a sense of, well, we can't, you can't get rid of that song. No, we can, you can't get rid of that. That tells the story that leads into this, and then you realize it really does work as as a whole. Or well, that's the intention, is it? It's the it's the sum of the parts, and um, it, it's it's it they work individually, but they also they all support each other in in a listening experience. And now you know with, with the TikTok and and this kind of new kind of culture where everything's got to be ten seconds, or literally just got to be that you got to be able to encapsulate everything into like a tiny amount of time. Um, I thought, well, you know, there's got to be some balance, and and I think there is, I think there is definitely a, a reaction against that across the generations not just um yeah just like just not like old farts or anything i mean my kids my kids are also really into you know getting vinyl and looking at the album and leafing through the pictures and um and the whole experience of listening to an album uh, from beginning to an end and there being some kind of concept or story you know it's it just it just works and and um i guess it's it's making a, a resurgence yeah, it's quite nice to see that because um, I've always been a like uh, advocate for, you know, because I, I was in a band back back ten where are we now fifteen years ago, and and it was always guitar player. Say again, you guitar player. No, I was a I was a DJ like scratch DJ. Right. Okay. Uh, I was in a like a new metal band, if you will, and um, that sort of hip hop and rock crossover that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s um, right. <laughs> um and and I, I was always like whenever we were writing and things like that I was always like pushing for the story you know why why are we doing this what's the what's the you know what's the because those those songs live on because they are stories they're like books um and you can get throwaway you know I don't, I don't know yeah throwaway music where it's just like the over repetition of the same thing over and over and over again um that do doesn't really go anywhere but obviously you know it can hit people in the right way make people dance make people happy um and all that kind of good stuff but the stories of the big songs now you look at some of the sort of iconic songs over the years they're all big stories you look at queen you look at you know bohemian rhapsody it's a story you know you look at you know, bon jovi living on a prayer it's a story you know about two people you know it's a story about about um, a girl in a wet t-shirt yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> very visual yeah you're, about, you're absolutely right you're absolutely right and and um you know you know it, the, even even the you know i think you know that, that there was a lot of classic albums that that we that we were listening to we grew up with and we were listening to that old classic uh kind of 60s stuff when we were at college so we were we were already like the you know the freak the freaky psychedelic kids you know me and Lonzo and my cousin Saul who was the original singer in the band um you know we 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 were already kind of like living in the past hanging out with the art how art block kids who were into the indie thing or the goth thing and um 
and I think that there's a certain amount of like bands who who keep the the tradition going. It's not like you're necessarily imitating, but you're you're kind of keeping it alive and and introducing new people. So and then they connect. So obviously, you know, you were connecting with our music because you were listening to also records that you've grown up with. And so there's a sort of continuity uh, as, as the music evolves. And I remember, you know, when I was at college and the Stone Roses came out, I knew, oh, they listened to the Monkees and they listened to someone like Garfunkel and, you know, Funk. And, 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 and we just got this sense of, yeah, they're part of our gang, you know? And so you, 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 you're part of a tribe, not just of your haircut or anything, but it's, it's, the kind of music, the kind of records, the kind of history. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And and it's sort of along, like you're saying, along those lines. And some of those like back classic bands, they're not, they don't make out that for whatever reason, they're not making albums anymore. Be it, you know, members of past, like you know, obviously the Beatles, there's like two of them left, <laughs> and stuff like that. So they're not, there's no new boot, new Beatles records, and it's up to the musicians now to follow on that that side of you know that that style of music, so people can go back. You know be that gateway you know and a lot of bands like you can like i interview a lot of like younger musicians and stuff and a lot of their gateway bands were bands that were around when i was in my mid-20s you know coming up 30 and they they weren't like my bands i was aware of them but they weren't and then it makes me realize my age at that point but you know that's their gateway and then they go back and they listen to whatever i'm like I'm, I'm liking this gateway bands yeah phrase. i mean i've heard of gateway drugs but gateway bands you know like oh i all started with cool shaker and then there was a gateway <laughs> gateway to shaker is a gateway band it's very funny <laughs> um well music is my drug if you will so it's kind of like you know yeah. it fits very well <laughs> on that front um but have you have you found um uh i'd say i mean like the music industry as a whole because obviously back in the mid 90s it's very different um in the you know you mentioned like these days with things like tiktok and things like that where the attention span is very um very minimal and you know there is this viral thing where something can pick up you know even for an hour um, or even you know if you're lucky a day and things like that and um how have you adapted i mean i know you've had other projects in between cooler shaker i know you're in the sort of film industry as well uh, which we'll talk about in a minute if that's all right because I do love the films that you've co-directed uh, um, but um, yeah how have you found like adapting in the music industry to that is it something that you worry about or do you let other people sort of like guide you with it in terms of making like in decisions about career in the industry yeah. itself releasing and stuff like that how you go about like because uh, obviously like back back like mid 90s there was always like this sort of yeah. three four month wait like djs and radio would get the music well in advance um so they'd be playing it on the radio and, and people would be waiting for it to come out um and then it would come out and then obviously you'd have the sort of like more um like tours and stuff going on but i've just noted like just with various like bands that i've seen they're sort of like drip feeding songs to people before really or not even really worrying about an album they just release it as the compilation of all these singles coming out yeah. and, and the release schedules are very different um i found yeah, it i mean they, you know I, I knew this young guy who we did some dates with a guy called willow robinson and um he just got managed by uh, alan mcgee and uh, alan mcgee had sold his his creation and, and a bunch of bunch of stuff and and he was managing this this young guitarist songwriter and and will had said to him oh thanks alan i'm so i'm so uh, i'm so chuffed i've got you know someone as experienced as you i'm really looking forward to learning about the music business and alan mcgee said well i don't know anything about the, mu the music business has completely changed i have no clue what's going on anymore <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to find out together and 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 it's it's true in, in many respects in the, the you know people still want to listen to music and they want to connect with music in the same way uh, people haven't changed that much um but the kind of uh, the culture obviously has been tipped on its head and when i when i when i you know, left the band and, and we had this massive break between 2000 and 2005 and i came back and the whole thing with streaming had happened in that time 
and and the music business was literally like the twin towers you know it was just like it, it was the people did people just didn't know what the hell was going on they were completely in, sh in shock and uh so we went we said oh we're going to make another record and we talked to a few of the record companies and it was just like we, we'd gone out of fashion you know and they'd moved on in five years and they were insecure about their jobs and they literally didn't know what was going on and so we made the decision at that point to start up our own label and and to basically you know for want of a better phrase reset and restart from from ground zero and we did and it it, it was it was rewarding and it was really good for us as a band as as friends but it was a long it's it's had taken a long time to get to where we are now which is where we just really feel primed to kind of go out again <laughs> go out again properly and and have some momentum behind us nice nice and what are your plans i see you've got a couple of dates coming up in a few we gotta, yeah we're gonna save the world again you yeah. know uh, uh, you know every day you gotta save the world it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it, don't, it never ends it's not like you know the avengers you know like you know you save the world everyone shakes hands and slaps each other on the back and that's it done it's like every day you got to go out there yeah. and i think there has to be a certain you have to have that sense of um purpose uh when you play you know i mean i i, I love those concerts i know there's a lot of hippies at woodstock obviously there was a lot of people talking you know a lot of nonsense but there was also that sense of like we're going to change the world and 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 you have to i think it's really empowering i don't i don't um sign up to this idea that that nothing changed i think they did change the world and but you got to keep going you have to do it every day it's another it's another battle that needs to be fought and people uh people got to come together yeah no definitely definitely um well, I'm hoping to come to one of your gatherings on that front. <laughs> the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I look forward to that. But um, so where are you? Where are you? What, what gig will you come to? Uh, I think the nearest one is either the London or the Victorious Festival. Okay. Between London and, and the South Coast. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, I think there'll be more more dates towards the end of the year. I think that's the point. We've we've had these huge breaks where I've been doing films and Ron's has been producing, and everyone's got other lives. That this kind of happens, you know, when you when you get older and you've got families and all sorts of things. But um, yeah, we're, we're I, I think this next phase is going to be a, a lot more continuous. Excellent. Well, I'll keep an eye out for, for for the shows, and if they're local enough, then I'll I will I will attend. I love going to live shows, and it's been almost twenty years since I've seen you guys, so it would be it would be good. It would be nice. Um, but no, talking of films and stuff, I just I like just obviously reading up beforehand, and and I'm not really noticing, but I loved um, Fantastic Fear of Everything, which I know you're involved with as as co-director. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I'd written a bunch of films, and I, and I, you know, films are really hard things to get made. This is a lot, even a cheap film is expensive, you know. But um, yeah, it, eventually, you know, there was a few things that I was trying to get made, and that that one uh, started to happen because Simon Pegg came on board, mm. and he, uh, and he uh loved loved that character and it and it was also a really anarchic film it was there was it was a very strange structure it was like almost like a play some parts of it and it was very eccentric and he wanted to do something bonkers and <laughs> we certainly granted him that wish and i i hooked up because i it was my first film i hooked up with a director called chris hopewell who'd done this amazing animation video for radiohead and um so you know we hooked up and 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 and, and made it and then i made another film la a couple of years ago now called slaughterhouse rules i was going to mention that yes um, which was a sort of uh, public school abattoir movie um it was a semi autobiographical therapy session where i got to vent I was going to ask if that had any like influence but um yeah i was going to mention that film as well cuz i enjoyed that as well and um 
yeah, yeah it was one of those it was one of those films that um the uh the studio is trying to ruin uh, as, as you as you go as especially one person was trying to ruin that film and um and there were some funny meetings but because i i had done a, a, just a year just a year at public school and 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 had survived to tell the tale and um we were doing a, a, a read through and at one point simon Pegg just looked up and he said this is just a really expensive therapy session isn't it <laughs> I'm getting some stuff off my chest, but there's a there was a song I I had a a song in that in that movie which uh, we were going to use a, a version of the Black Sabbath song Changes um, that someone had covered and we couldn't afford it and the money just ran out so I wrote a song quickly for the sequence in the film where one of the kids you know is having a bit of an emotional breakdown the night before you know, all the monsters turn up and and it and it turned out really good so that is the song on this album, uh, on this new album called Love and Separation. Oh, it's, not, it's nothing to do with being separated by monsters. Okay, good. <laughs> no, but I love that. I mean, obviously, you know, given your sort of, I guess, heritage and your parents and things, the movie industry is something that has been there for you um, on their front. Was that something you've always kind of wanted to do? Or is it an opportunity that came up and you thought, actually, yeah, I could probably do this. Is this something that, you know, no, I, 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 I absolutely um, mad mad about films and and I wanted to do it and it, it took me about ten years to get it to, to to kind of get something off the ground. But you know, like like you said, you know, um, so 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 many great songs and albums are stories, mm. and with Cool Shaker, we were definitely trying to create move cinematic uh, kind of you know. Um, you know, put portraits in people's minds. I think there's, yeah, there's even a lyric. Griff, when you did, I paint the picture in your mind. A literally frustrated filmmaker from the beginning. Nice. And tracks like Magic Theatre, you know, um, were just blatantly, you know, trying to trying to kind of do a cinematic yeah. escape. So um, it was inevitable. It was inevitable, yeah. I was going to say, my because my wife was very, like, excited as well that I was chatting to you, and she's a big fan of your mother's, so... It was like, <laughs> she was like, oh God. Um, so yeah, she loves like classic films and stuff like that. So it's very um, like Pollyanna, obviously, you know, a big one. But um, yeah, it's uh, it was just uh, curious to see if that was something in your, like, you know, what you wanted to do on that front. But no, I enjoyed those films. Obviously, have you got anything else in the works on that front or? Um, yeah, I'm working on a, I'm working on a, uh, a psychedelic television show with Simon Pegg again, um, called Technicolor Time Machine, Ooh. Ooh. which is uh, it's actually a, a book from the late '60s by a guy called Harry Harrison, um, who uh, it's a fantastic it's a fantastic romp about a film crew with a time machine, and um, we've been working on that for quite a while now, actually. Yeah, yeah fingers crossed. We're getting close to the dream becoming a reality excellent well i'll look out for that definitely um because i do like simon Pegg as well i think he's a great actor it, um, involves, it involves it involves time travel uh film crews and vikings real life vikings that works for me so <laughs> that hits all the right spots for me so that's okay um well i've got a couple of questions left for you crispin if that's all right and i'll let you get on with the rest of your day or evening as it is now um if so i think we've got have we got enough time is that yeah. right? Yeah, cool. Um, so I've got basically these are my sort of standard ending questions, if you will. So it's the sort of standard part of my show. But what I want to find out from you are your three um most pinnacle albums that that kind of shape the person that you are. So the one that kind of, you know, for instance, the one that made you want to be in a band, you know, the music industry as a whole, or you know, so uh, just a, a random album that hit you at the right time. It doesn't have to be like the best of like band the particular band's album um but yeah just if you've got three you can name that'd be great yeah it's a tough one it is a tough one i mean i had a you know you talk about the the formative years hmm. I, I can't narrow it down to three but i i can i can narrow it down to a, a time in my life <clears throat> and and like you say you know the music that you listen to when you're in your early teens i think it i think it does shape you and scar you 
Yes. Uh, and and, and you know, I know a lot of people who, for instance, you know, they they saw Time Bandits, Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits at a certain time in their life, and it it kind of shaped their imagination. <laughs> like the the cake was baked at that point. And they they see the world or they're able to see the world in a certain way, thanks to Terry Gilliam's imagination. And I certainly feel like that about that film, for instance. It left a huge impression. But my my big run in, you know, the song, the, the, the song and the band that made me want to play electric guitar was was the Kinks. And you know, that that was like that was when I heard those early Kink singles, like you really got me. You know, I, li I literally had a sort of a, a kind of a, a, I was transported. I was called to the cross, you know. Uh, but but the, the the albums that really kind of just like took took me and 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 um, I was devoted to were were the Deep Purple albums. You know that that you know that's that early scarring, <laughs> like eleven, twelve years old. Um, Live in Japan was the first Deep Purple album I ever ha uh, heard. I heard Smoke on the Water live, you know, Highway Star live, and that that band at the top of the game. It's just, it's it's affected so many musicians, yeah. so many like all and all the metalheads. You know that 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 is the one. That's where you know that it all kind of goes off from that point, and. Um, I remember going to my local record store, I think it was Kingston, you know, someone had said was, you know, people, when people used to leave through vinyl yes. and there was like, you know, um, you know, you could get a unk on a pen, on a, a pendant on the wall and, you know, all of that kind of like, you know, rock metal tap. And, and I went in this shop and I was looking through and I found Deep Purple. I was looking for a Deep Purple album and I found, Deep Purple in Rock. And I thought that looks like a proper rock album. So I went up to the desk and I was, I must have looked really young. And I was, and I put it across the desk. I said, I'd like to buy this, please. And this this metalhead, just this old metalhead, look over. He looked at the album and he looked at me and he went, That is a classic rock album. <laughs> and I think it really made his day that he felt like he was. It was a rewarding moment for him. He felt like he was really like sharing the knowledge, sharing the love, and and passing it on. Uh, and I, it 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 really made me laugh on the way home because I could tell the guy was passing on the grail. <laughs> yeah, you found it. Now it's yours. <laughs> you chose wisely on that front. Um, but no, that's fantastic. I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, I love. I still love going through record stores now. I mean. The great resurgence of vinyl is great, but I still like going through the dusty racks, if you will, and digging through great really? stuff. Yeah, uh, quite fortunate to have a few record stores around me at the moment um, that can facilitate that need, which is good. Um, and I was fortunate enough to live in the United States for a bit as well, and they've got some magnificent uh, record stores, especially where near where I was um, living at the time, um, like a warehouse just full of vinyl. And you could just pick up stuff that is just, you know, you know, someone made this record that no one's heard of. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, someone deliberately pressed this record and and I've got like stacks of vinyl in boxes right next to me here and stuff. So it's just sort of something I love doing. And obviously you saw the decks behind me. Um, and it's still something I like to 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 use. Um, I buy newer vinyl now as well, if something takes me, but Nothing's quite like going through those uh, dusty uh, crates and finding <laughs> gems, you know. <laughs> Very treasure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a big old treasure hunt. Um, so my last question for you, Crispian, um, yeah. before I let it go, is what, we already covered half this, but what are your hobbies away from music? So when you're um, not doing anything cool as Shaker or anything in the sort of film industry, what what is your what is your thing what do you do to sort of you know make get away from it if you will you mean like do i have a life yes and no you know i mean it depends on the hobby but yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah my my hobbies um you know i mean i'm a i'm i'm a i'm a dad you know and that that's a huge part of my life but i don't think being a dad is a hobby 
I mean, my, 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 my hobby is, my hobby is, um, I guess, you know, I guess even like, you know, spiritual life, it's not a hobby. That's just, that's, that's how you live. My hobby is probably history. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a bit of a history nerd. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I guess that's the most boring answer you've had. No. Do I win a prize? <laughs> I've had I've had others on that front, but no, history is something I like as well. It's something that um, I get my kids involved in, like obviously day trips and stuff like that to various. Yeah, awesome. yeah. My kids, my kids are my kids are homeschooled, and okay. one of one of the you know my 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 wife Jo, she uh, she she's full time with them, and 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 you know they have like a network, a community of homeschool kids. And one of the great things is they they go off to museums all the time and yeah and um and uh, and they often go to places when you know when the schools are are on so it's very quiet um, but yeah I, I love I love to sit you know my kids my kids they 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 indulge me they let me go off and and um, you know muse on history the great thing about history it's I guess it brings us full circle with with music is that you know everything is connected nothing nothing exists in isolation and where where how the world is and and how people are behaving there's a reason for it there's a connection you could call it karma i think you know the law of action and reaction but you know um, all music has got roots uh, just as the, the world that we live in you know there's a there's a story there and we're all trying to make sense of that story we're all trying to tell that story definitely well, Crispian, thank you very much. I, All right, pleasure to meet you. I, I really appreciate everything. Um, like I said, huge fan. I look forward to seeing you guys live again um, in the in the near future. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving the album. Um, um, I hope it does, does well for you on that front and, you know, um, all the good stuff that kind of comes with that and and more films from you as well um that the time machine uh technicolor time machine um project yeah like music. Nice one. so uh i look forward to seeing that but yeah have a good rest of your evening um i hope you've not got too many more of these today <laughs> but um this was it oh this was I'm, it all right well cool well, my family now yeah i'll say go go spend some time with the family and uh yeah have a good one man thank you cheers take care bye bye